Well, hello, it's Graham Dargie here and welcome to the Viewfinders Photography Podcast. My guest today is eight times World Press Photo Award winning sports photographer Tim Clayton. I'll introduce Tim properly in a minute, but first, well, you might have heard me mention in the last few weeks Viewfinders Live, an evening with Mark McCall sponsored by MPP. Well, it all went down this past Monday on Zoom. Uh, this was a long time coming for me, and by Monday night I was so ready to get into it. So, uh, we had a great turnout, people joining from all over Scotland, which I expected, but also from Cumbria, Shropshire, East Sussex, Surrey, Cheshire, Suffolk, you name it. Mark's presentation was fantastic, as I knew it would be, and a real testament to what a great photographer he is. Um, so, the crowd was great, Mark was great, great Q&A, lots of great questions, great answers, and uh, somebody won that £50 MPB voucher, and all was well. Uh, certainly a couple of things I can iron out for next time, but the feedback's been overwhelmingly positive. So thanks again to Mark McCall, thanks to MPB for sponsoring the event, and thank you to every single person who bought tickets and came along to make it such a memorable night. Otherwise, you can connect with me on Instagram as usual at Viewfinders Podcast, and check out view-finders.co.uk where you can find out all about what I do and get my free long exposure landscapes video. Okay, time to introduce this week's amazing guest, Tim Clayton. Tim is a multi-award winning sports photographer who's covered six Summer Olympics, four Winter Olympics, five Rugby World Cups, the Football World Cup, the Baseball World Series, over 30 Grand Slam Tennis Championships and just about every other sporting event you can think of. Tim's won eight World Press Photo Awards, three of which were first place awards and four of Tim's photos were named in the top 50 sports photographs of all time by the Observer Sports Magazine in 2003. So we're dealing with an expert here. This is a longer than usual episode, but Tim just gave so much great information and insight to the conversation, and there was really only so much I could edit out. Uh, We covered Tim's photography journey, starting in the dark room at the Yorkshire Post as a 16-year-old, all the way through to the Olympics. Uh, The important role of the press in today's fake news culture, Uh, Of course, a dip into camera gear and technique, how Tim came across his mantra of failing forward, and much, much more. Tim also names some of the best sports photographers for you to follow, and links are in the show notes. So if you're interested in photography, sport, journalism, or just life in general, then you're going to take something away from this episode. Here's my conversation with Tim Clayton. Hi, Tim. How's it going? (laughs) Hey, Graham. How are you? Good good to talk to you. Thank you for having me on. This is an honor for me, and... Everything is going well, you know, despite the lockdown, and uh, it's uh, Groundhog Day number 1,646 or something, but otherwise, yeah. things are good, thank you. Yeah, well, I appreciate you coming on. I actually watched Groundhog Day a week or two ago, because I wondered if I could pick up some coping strategies or something. <laughs> I was going to say, but, only um, once? You've only watched it once? <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, I don't remember what day it was, but it actually doesn't matter what day it is just now anyway. So No, Exactly. Um, So I'm really keen to talk to you and um, I try to talk to all kinds of different photographers on the show and I really wanted to get a really good sports photographer so I'm glad that you give me your time. Where are you based at the moment Tim? Well that's a a story in itself. We've actually moved to to Ireland in the last few months. Um, It's been an incredible journey even even in the past year but we, we, we were in France and we got totally, uh, totally screwed by Brexit, unfortunately, um, mm-hmm. without going into the details. And we decided that we had to, we had to leave, really. And um, uh, <laughs> I, I have um, <laughs> a little bit of Irish blood in my DNA, and it just had a bit of a calling. And uh, and as well, we, we we literally thought, hang on a minute, if we go rural in Highland somewhere, it's going to be a lot safer than being in a big city right now. And this was, you know, I'm, we're talking about six, seven months ago, making this decision. Decision, and um, so we, you know, we um, we up sticks, and we're now in Kerry, in Ireland. And uh, so, I mean, I haven't really got into the to the workings here because we haven't been able to. I I did shoot the um, French Open in October, uh, where I flew back to France and and shot that. But uh, other than that, there's not not a lot's been happening in the in the work front as you can imagine as most of our colleagues are in the same boat you know when did you first realize i'm always interested in how people came to photography so when did you first uh, realize photography might be for you 
Okay, well, it, it's, this is a bit of a long story, and if, I'll try not to bore you, but my dad was actually a sports journalist, and um, he worked for the, for the Yorkshire Evening News in Leeds, and then he worked for the Daily Express after that. Um, and unfortunately, he was in a, a really bad car accident where his, um, his best friend got killed, and he went through the car windscreen, and he survived that. And then a couple of months later, he dropped out of a heart attack um tragically in in a pub and um that unfortunately um killed my mother my mother died of a broken heart 18 mm -hmm. months later so suddenly at eight years old both my parents had died and i was adopted oh, um it wasn't it wasn't uh uh the best upbringing you know there's a lot of stuff happening in you know the, the adopted family's house and and i found um you know sport became a big part of my escapism um you know along with scouting scouting was escapism and uh mm -hmm. you know I, I read every agatha christie book so hercule poirot and hercule poirot, poirot sorry and uh miss marple became my sort of grandparents so to speak mm -hmm. you know so you know I, at first those 10 years from eight to Oh, eight years from eight to 16. It was just like, I felt it was just like survival. Mm. And uh, one day, and I was hopeless at school. I was absolutely hopeless. Not because I was hopeless mentally. It was just, I couldn't write. Nobody could read whatever I wrote, you know. And it, it was before, it was before computers or anything, obviously. And uh, so at 16, it was better look for a job because there's no further education for me. And um, I was looking through the newspaper one day and it, they had this uh, advert trainee photographic technician Yorkshire Evening Post and I thought wow you know my uh, my father used to be in the newspaper that sounds and it, you know it sounds fantastic to uh, yeah to to a young guy you know so I applied for the job and lo and behold the guy who interviewed me had worked with my dad on the Yorkshire Evening mm. News and wow. as it is in you know um, rural areas you know I he, they took pity on me and I, I managed to get the job. I'd never even had a camera. I never had a mm. camera. <laughs> and I got the job in the darkroom of the Yorkshire Evening Post. And, uh, you know, after about... My my, um, my adopted father gave me his... He had a little... It, it was a folding bellows camera called uh, Kershaw 450, which was actually made in, in Leeds. And I think the fastest speed mm. was like a two-inch of a second or something. And uh, he gave me this uh, camera to practice with and uh, well it was 1976 and there was a um a heat wave and we had a basset hound dog with the big ears and uh my sister who was the same or my adopted sisters we were the same age and uh she was laid in the garden with a bikini next to the dog and i took a picture of it just as the dog looked up and it when we looked at the negative it looked like the dog's head was on my sister's body so <laughs> you know i, I um you know, I showed it to the, uh, you know, the picture editor and he, they, they all laughed and, you know, the next, the next, oh, that day it ran in the um, Yorkshire Evening Post on the front page, you know, everybody's, wow. you know, this is the effects of the heat wave. And of course, I was just like, to see your picture that you've taken and your name in print and uh, it was, and that was, you know, very early on in my career, like I was 16 years old and Mm. And that was it. It was a, it just clicked, and you know I loved sport, and then the photography. I just got the photography book, you know. Mm. So, uh, you know, I just kept. I was in the dark room, and I just kept going along with all the other photographers who were brilliant at the at the post, and they would take me out to assignments. I'd even go to Leeds games, and you know, just mm. starting to learn learn the trade. And uh, five years later, I think I was twenty one. They took me on as a trainee photographer. Mm. and you know i just progressed from there basically that's great so in that five years you would have known the dark room stuff inside and out i guess yes yeah it was a great it was great training i mean you were printing yeah. other photographers you know you were mixing the chemicals and the coffee mm. and hopefully not together <laughs> but sometimes you did you yeah. know but uh um yeah i mean it was amazing training i loved it you know it was all all part of the the all part of the mystique of it all, you know, and uh, yeah, I learned and learned and learned. And uh, mm. I, the great thing is I, I you know, I, got, I had the, once you get that passion in your heart and your mind and you want to run with it, it's, mm. it's, you know, it, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it was easy, 
but it helps you know if you if mm. you love something and yeah. you want to do it you will put in the hours that you need to make yourself better yeah. I was going to ask if the other photographers kind of took you under their wing. It sounded like they did. But the other thing that came up that occurred to me while you were talking was how much you would have learned just from processing the other photographer's image. You started to get that imagery and that way of seeing maybe into your subconscious just by the processing and developing of those photos. Would that be, would you think that's that happened? Absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's it, you're immersing yourself in all aspects of photography. Yeah, the, 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 like, you know, everybody to a man on the, on, but it was the Yorkshire Post and the Yorkshire Evening Post. Everybody helped me. They were just amazing, you know, and, mm. and even the darkroom staff, they were all amazing. They'd cover for me. And, and then the printing itself, like you say, you're looking at pictures, you're looking at what's good, what's, what's not good. Uh, and that mm. all helps to, to give you an understanding of what, I mean, you know, in those days it was press photography. I mean, it was, mm. you know, on an, on an evening paper. Um, it's you know the photographers that you're shooting. You can be shooting seven or eight assignments a day, you know, and mm. and it's a lot of a lot of you know get in there, get a picture that's usable, and then go on to the next job. I mean that obviously changed later in my career when I became a full time sports photographer in Sydney. But uh, you know the early days, it was it was the best training you could possibly have, I think. You know, and my goodness, I made some horrendous mistakes. But it was a great place to make horrendous mistakes, you know. What became apparent to you quickly when you started shooting? Was there was there any penny that dropped where you thought, this is the thing, or I'm doing this wrong, anything like that? I think in the early days, you know, I was hopeless. But, um, you know, you've got to learn. You've got to learn everything. You've got to learn exposure. You've got to learn shutter speeds, apertures, composition. Mm -hmm. You know, you name it. You have to, you have to learn it. And, you know, you the best way is to learn by mistakes you're failing mm. forward that's the, that's the key thing and, and i'm still at that stage now where i'm failing forward you've mm. got to keep failing forward you've got to make that mistake learn from it and improve and mm. and i think that's you know if you have that fun you know that fundamental um ability to be able to think like that and do that then y your ceiling keeps getting higher rather than mm. have that's the point i'm aiming aiming for and you stop you know, I think it's so important to keep your mind open in that sense to, to improve yourself. You know, I'm definitely not there yet. You know, I still make <laughs> mistakes, you know, and mm. I, you, you still see fantastic work from other photographers and you go, wow, you know, how did they see that? You know, I, I was there and I didn't see that, but they saw yeah. something that you didn't see. And and I love that. You know, I, yeah. I, you know, I used to, you know, in, in the sort of, not the early days, but probably in the main part of my career, I used to beat myself up something awful, you know, and I've, mm. I've learned to, you know, not do that anymore. I can, I can live with myself a little bit more, but gee, I probably had 20 or 30 years in my career where I absolutely hammer myself uh, mm. mentally. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, again, I think it's all part of that drive. You know, I don't know a good photographer who hasn't got that, that, will and that desire and that want and you have yeah. to have that as, as long as as well as everything else you know mm -hmm. it's it's so important yeah i know exactly what you mean and especially about um when you're seeing what other people are photographing who are just next to you and you're going okay i didn't i would never have done that but it's really good um and so i was wondering what's the structure like when you're working for a paper? Um, because I, I just work on my own and I, I have to sh turn things around for a PR company or whoever. So there is a, there's a brief, but I don't know how it is when you, when you're working with a paper, do you report to the photo editor? Are there certain expectations for the type of pictures they would want to shoot or how free were you to shoot the way that you would see it? And was there ever a sort of a conflict between what you would have liked to have shoot and the way that you knew that the paper might have preferred it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, again, I think early on you're, you're very, uh, you're trying to please, please the picture editor all the time. You're trying to make sure you do a good job to, <laughs> to appease the, the boss, you know, to, to make sure that the level of your consistency of what you're doing, and it doesn't matter what level you're at. If, this can be a local newspaper level or, working for a, you know a top daily you know uh, you know i mean i i was doing shifts for the new york times for instance when i 
um, was in New York for a while, and mm. so it doesn't it doesn't matter. The principle is the same. You're trying to make sure you do a job, the the correct job that the pitch editor wants you to do. Mm-hmm. Having said that, you know I, I I know when I was working for the City Morning Herald. I mean we had a lot of discussions about the ethics of what we were doing, and so you know I, I had a particular problem where where if you were given a brief and you went on the assignment and the reality was not what the brief was. The reality was something different. So then you had a conflict. Do I shoot what they told me to shoot mm-hmm. or do I shoot what I'm seeing? And and then, you know, so, so I ended up, you know, rebelling a little bit against that and say, look, you know, I understand what the brief is, but this is the reality, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, it's not what you're saying. And And I'm telling you, this is what I saw and this is, you know, what the situation is. So then you get into a conflict and you have to be strong enough to, I guess, stand your corner because that's where the conflicts happen. If, if somebody at a desk is telling you this is a story and that's what they want and you're saying that might be the story that you think is, but it's not the story that I'm seeing when I'm in mm. the situation. So it, it, there is a conflict there and it's hard to deal with it. And, you know, a lot of photographers will don't like conflict and mm. don't want to argue that point that, the ethics, you know, it's funny now we, we talk about fake news and, you know, we were, you know, quite a few of us, you know, throughout my career have been banging on about how wrong it is to take fake news photographs or contrive mm-hmm. them or set them up, you know, and, uh, you know, and now here we are, look at this, you know, we're in fake news, you know, fake news central at the moment, you know, and yeah. uh, a lot of that is to do with, with, you know, newspapers not having not having enough ethics of what they're doing, and and everything else is squeezed into that space, and it's mm. a- affecting real news. You know, uh, yeah. I, I mean, you see it every day, and you you hear discussions about it every day. You look at the papers, you look at, you know, what the Mail or the Express or the Times or the Guardian or the Independent are using every day, and you can you can see that there's news and there's opinions. And then there's political agendas that are coming into it as well. So we're in a bit of a, you know, a quandary at the moment. And I, I think the, you know, the press itself has to really step up, to step up again and start have, drawing a line in the sand and start telling the truth on everything, not, mm. not bending it for a political cause or, you know, uh, I mean, you can, I, I can go on for hours about that, you know, but uh, it's, it's just, I guess it's a beef that I've got at the moment by having worked in the industry for, you know, 30, 30 odd years. And, uh, um, you know, it's sad. I, I'm, I was delivering newspapers when I was 12 and, you know, you spend all that time of your, of your career in newspapers and you see them dying and you, you see why they're dying, you know. And I know mm. there's all the, you know, internet and clicks and everybody, well, nobody can read more than a paragraph now. And, you know, um, but it's, it's important that, that we get back on some kind of uh, direction with, with truth. Yeah, yeah, it's important. And it, uh, if there's a narrative that's true, it won't come from politicians. You know, it, it just won't come from the voices that are the loudest in society. So I think, yeah, obviously journalism has an incredibly important role there uh, without going let's talk about photography so uh, i was wondering um what point you moved to sydney i know you went from yorkshire to sydney i wasn't sure exactly where that was on your timeline so what what happened around that time yeah so this was uh late 80s um i you know so i was i was getting like 26 27 uh decided i wanted to be a sports photographer and i was still a jack of all trades Okay. And I couldn't get a job anywhere in Britain to be a sports photographer. I tried, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, the best I got was an offer for a, of a job on the European, which was a new paper that was forming. But then I mm-hmm. managed to get this. Uh, I, you know, I literally wrote to every paper in Australia, and I managed to get this. Uh, uh, there was a guy. The, the picture editor of the Sydney Morning Herald was a guy called Julian Zakaris. So he was a, a lovely, typical Aussie Ocker guy, you know. And uh, um, he. Uh, I, I, you know, went down to see him and showed him my portfolio. And I think I'd, I'd just won. I'd won like the rugby league photographer of the year. And rugby league is massive in, uh, in Sydney. And I'd also okay. got a world press award, which was, you know, for me, it was just incredible, but it gave me a little bit of a bit of, um, uh, uh, kudos, if you like, you know, when I'm going for a job interview and yeah. they kept the job open for me for two years while I went through the whole process of, 
trying to emigrate and uh, finally finally got there. And, uh, you know, best, probably the single best thing I've ever done in terms of mm-hmm. a career move, you know. And, yeah. um, you know, within, I think within 18 months, I was shooting sport full time on the Sydney Morning Herald with my two colleagues, uh, uh, you know, Craig Golding and Steve Christo, who were both brilliant sports photographers in their own right. And, you know, we suddenly had this, you know, amazing situation where we had three full-time sports photographers shooting for the Sydney Morning Herald. And it was, you know, halcyon days. We had a period there where, um, you know, as well as Craig and Steve and myself, you had, you know, Adam Pretty came, was coming through as a trainee on the newspaper and he's now one of the world's best sports photographers. Um, right. And then you have like Daniel Berahulak, who is probably one of the world's best, you know, documentary news photographers, who was a trainee working in the uh, uh, sports department for Getty, and he was he was there. And then Trent Park was a sports photographer on on uh, the Australian, and he's now a Magnum photographer, you know. And then you had you know lots of other people coming through, you know, Cameron Spencer, who's now you know multi award winning, brilliant photographer. Um, you know, Phil Hillier, Brett Costello and Greg Porteous on the opposition. So all of a sudden you had this amazing coming together of like-minded people, which mm. it was almost, you know, you can call it fate or luck or, we, but we just suddenly had this great camaraderie where we were all trying to take absolutely great sports photos. And we had, we had a, you know, a small period period there where we were, we were literally, you know, setting setting the world on fire, and we were producing some really good work. And uh, um, okay, it doesn't last forever, but it, you know, you look back at it now and think, my goodness, you know, those were halcyon days, and uh, mm-hmm. I certainly look back at them with great fondness. It was an amazing time. So, how did you find the move, just on a sort of personal level? Was it any challenges getting into the culture or anything like that, or you just sort of just sort of found your stride when you got there? Very, very quickly found my stride. Uh, you know, the Australian people are amazing people. I mean, the, you've got to be able to take a joke, but uh, mm-hmm. coming from Yorkshire, that was uh, quite easy, you know, and uh, um, they're, they're just great people, you know. The Kiwis are great as well, and the camaraderie is fantastic. And they, they have a, they have a, it's funny, it's funny you see the, dif- the different little subtleties in, uh, in how you do things. So, say in Britain, they say, yeah. You know, you're only as good as your last picture, whereas in Australia they say you're only as good as your next picture, and it's mm. that psychology of mm. of looking at something in a different way that yeah. that okay, that's that's today I draw the line and I've got to do a good picture tomorrow, you know, and yeah. and I, you know I found all those little things uh, uh, fascinating, and they they you know the whole live to work work to live thing as well. I mean they. You know, if those surfs up, you know, half of the staff wouldn't come in. <laughs> it was just they would be surfing. You know, it's just yeah. okay. The surfs up, you know. So you know, just how it was. It's just how it was. <laughs> is that is there sort of an inherent optimism in the culture? Because that the way that you said that you're as good as your next picture just sounds optimistic to me. Very, very much so. Very much so. And I think I think I got an amazing amount out of that because I think I'm quite a positive person, but being around all these guys, you know, I mean, mm. we, we, we'd have this, there was no jealousy. It was, it was, it was the opposite. It was quite the opposite that, you know, if just say Phil on the opposition got a great picture, we could, Hey, Phil, great shot, mate. That's an awesome mm, shot. You know? So that would encourage him. And then he would do the same again. So it was like, you know, one potato, two potato, three potato. It was, mm. it, it grew a culture of positivity within yeah. the whole, the whole working environment of the, the sports photographers in Sydney, you know, and, yeah. you know, I, I learned so much from that, you know, I learned so much from, from how to be part of that and how to help with that and how to get from it to make you better and, and keep yourself, uh, keep yourself focused on what you're doing. And we did. I mean, that, that was the thing. I, okay. <laughs> looking back at, at the time, you don't know those people are going to achieve what they're going to mm-hmm. achieve, but yeah. you know, I'm not surprised they have because the culture was was spot on you know and uh, mm. um i mean i i i think my days of ever being a, a boss are completely gone but if i ever was a picture editor i would certainly try to um you know instill that kind of a culture in a in a staff mm. without a doubt you see that in sport you know it's very it's very driven to go to a next level and be better without 
without I mean obviously there are negatives in there in some sporting fields but in a way you get it from the sport as well you see the professionalism of high end you know you watch Nadal playing at sort of Federer mm. my goodness you know I mean mm. they mentally are so tough and they want yeah. to get better and they want to win and mm. they will do anything they possibly can to win the next point and that's how it is win the next point it's like take your next picture it's the same kind of mental philosophy that you get from watching these great sports people i think uh just to touch on that i just think grand slam tennis is like the greatest sport in the world Love uh, it. it's, it's just like mentally like you say it's huge you know um and i i don't know like the fact that these those guys in particular and Djokovic, they haven't been knocked off by the next generation and Yet. their bodies are their bodies are going to give up before the next generation knock them down i think and i think that's just incredible mental strength on on their part i just, i think it's it's something that we're seeing that is amazing we they're phenomenal people so anyway i i pinched myself on many occasions going that's nadal and that's federer you know while i'm on the side of a court photographing them mm. or djokovic as well i mean let's not forget i mean he's a great player as well i mean I'm, you know, I'm 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 a Nadal, you know, I'm, I'm in the Nadal camp, but I can very easily be in the Federer camp, you know. Yeah. Although I think possibly Djokovic is going to be have the most slams at the end, at the end of the three of them. But yeah. I'm, I'm definitely Nadal is just, I mean, Federer has got the aura. I mean, that's the thing. Federer has this aura of absolute greatness, and then Nadal has it too. You know, it's a different, mm. and and it's his. He's just an incredible player. He's an incredible... I mean, I, I've been so blessed to... I mean, I'm part of the um, Tennis uh, Photographers Association. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, in Paris in, in October, you know, I'm sat there thinking, wow, I've done like... I've nearly done 30 Grand Slams, you know. And the guy mm. sat, next, sat, sat next to me. I said, oh, you know, how, how many Grand Slams uh, have, have you done? You know, he says... Uh, Oh, this is my hundred and seventy eighth. Okay, right. You know, I mean, these, these guys. I mean, you know, there's some amazing tennis photographers. Amazing. Mm. You know, I mean, uh, um, you know, I, I, I've loved, I, I've loved learning. I mean, I'm, I'm a you know, relative newbie in terms of shooting tennis, but you know, I've loved learning from all these guys. I mean, they're, they're, they're just, they're just incredible. Okay, we'll come back to it later. There's a shot of Nadal that I wanted to mention, actually, but we'll come back to some specific shots later on. But so, okay, so you're at Sydney, you're the sports photographer now, and um, so how does that work? You go to shoot the match um, or the race or whatever event you've got to shoot. How do you go into that photography-wise? Can is it possible to have images in mind before you go in, or? I mean, there you might know again. There are particular type of shots that the newspaper might run, or you just have to follow the story that's happening. What's this sort of approach mentally when you're going into covering an event like that? Okay, um, I'll just backtrack a little bit. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think first of all, I think you know, photography is a language. So as you are, as you start off, so I was starting off at sixteen. You're learning a language. You're learning how to speak that language. And human beings, you know, as you, you watch your own daughter, you know, you watch your own daughter, they copy, you know. Mm-hmm. So photographers copy. So it's a natural human instinct. So you see a good picture and you go and try and copy it. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, Adam Priddy is a fantastic example of this. So he was in, he was at uh, uh, college, uh, 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 a school in um, Sydney. And he literally cut out all the good pictures that he thought we took and went and recreated them with his friends. So if it was like a bubble shot that we had or, you know, underwater shots, he would would do everything. So he came in to the paper looking for a job when he was 16 and his folio was as good as our portfolios, (laughs) you know, because he'd literally looked at our photos and gone out and done exactly or not exactly the same, you know. But what happens when you're learning like that is you go through that point. It's like you learn a language. It's like learning how to speak French. Eventually, you start, you don't just speak in parrot, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> bonjour, ça va. You know, you start constructing your own sentences. And it's the same with photography. You go through that point where your own voice 
Your, your, your work becomes your own voice. It becomes unique. It becomes beyond everything that you've seen. It becomes mm. <laughs> something that is unique to you, that is your style. You know, and that yeah. doesn't happen overnight to a lot of people. It takes a long time. It took me a long time to develop my own style. I mean, I, I in my early days, I was like uh, Chris, uh, Amy McCabe and Chris Smith who were the sports photographers on The Observer and The, and the Sunday Times. And at the time, you know, Amy McCabe was my favorite. But it's funny because as time developed, you know, I, I, I became more like Chris Smith. My work became more artistic than, than news value. And I found that I look at my work now and think, my goodness, I was more intri- influenced by Chris Smith than I was by Eamon McCabe, even though I, at the time I thought Eamon was my favorite photographer. Mm. So I, I think that happens, you know, for a lot of photographers. They, they start to emulate, you know, people's work that they admire. And then hopefully they develop into their own voice. And I, I look at, you know, the top photographers now and, uh, you know, you, you can see, I, I can see their own voice. I mean, if you were asking, who, who do I think are the best three sports photographers right now? I would say like Bob Martin, uh, Adam Pretty, and Simon Broody. Simon Broody is my fam- favorite photographer at the moment. Um, and they all have one thing in common. They've got their own voice. You know, Mm -hmm. and they are five tooled. They they can do everything. You know, they're brilliant at. They've got a brilliant eye. They've got a great news sense. They're able to um, tell a story, a narrative with a photo essay, and they're great in the studio. You know, and they have the drive and the passion and enthusiasm as well. And if you've got all those things going for you, then you're going to be good. (laughs) If you get the break Mm -hmm. to to be good, if you get the canvas to be good, if you get uh, an ability to sell your work somewhere to be good. And that's, you know, becoming harder and harder for, for, for everybody in our field right now. But, you know, I think, I think those things, uh, uh, that, that, that voice that you develop is, is very important and that style you develop and it takes time, but you get there and you, you ultimately, you know, you're speaking with your own, your own voice. Did that make so, sense? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So when you, how do you start to deploy that? I mean, you, you, as you, as you start out, as you say, you're starting to, you're thinking, oh, this is what it should look like. I'll do it like what I've seen. And then gradually you start to sort of deploy your own style. How does that practically go? I mean, when you, when that style starts to become, or the way of shooting starts to become your own, are you now able to stop um, thinking about other shots, other people's photography while you're at the match on the sidelines? Are you start to go into a kind of flow of your own when you're doing that? Or um, yes. how much can yes. you how much can you do that? And how much do you need to just take your eye away from the camera sometimes and see what's happening elsewhere on the field to follow the game? Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, look, if, if you're working for a newspaper, it's very important you've got to have a news sense. I mean, it's mm-hmm. no good having a great try picture of the team that just lost, you know, 60 to six, yeah. you know, <laughs> you've got to, you've got to have the news pictures, but you also, you also develop that ability to, to see creatively and, and to look for something that's creative within what you're shooting and, uh, and in your editing as well. I mean, it can be, you can maybe even crop into an image that, you know, produces something that's, you know, very aesthetic and, uh, mm-hmm. I, it, it's not, there's not one day when that happens. It's just a process of, of I, if we go back to the Yorkshire Evening Post days where, say, I was shooting eight jobs a day to, on the Sydney Morning Herald, most days I would be shooting one assignment. So you could do all the things. You could arrive early. You could start looking around. You could check the place out. You could check angles, check the lights, see what you see all the different possibilities and, and mm. you know, different elements can can make good pictures whether it light and shade whether it be light and shade whether it be the action the composition of what you're doing whatever the sport is it doesn't matter what the sport is there's always some something that you can see that will help make that artistic and, and creative not just a very ordinary picture you know and sometimes that might be a portrait it can be anything but i think ultimately your consistency then is what is important. So you've got to be working at a, at a top consistent level. And if you're working at a top consistent level, you're going to get blips that are go, go above that top 
consistent level. I mean, it might be, you know, if I had a good year, I would say a good year for me was getting half a dozen good pitches. That would be a good year, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that's been brutally frank, you know? So you yeah. might say, say you might be trying to produce a folio at the end of the year if, for competitions or this is my work for the year. You might have six good pitches, but you need 10 and you're going, oh my goodness, you know, I'm four mm-hmm. short, what am I going? And you've been looking through the rest of your images to try and, hold those six pitches together so you have a good body of work that shows you know basically your your skills and your ability to 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 shoot sport so Mm. you know it's 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 something that again it's not there's not one day when that happens it's it's a it's a process and Mm. consistency is so important I think that's really uh important what you said about having six good pictures in a year because you know the the way photography is now people and a lot of us do it we'll shoot we'll put something up i know there's guys i follow on instagram they put something up before lunchtime that they shoot shot in the morning i was thinking um i was thinking about like musicians will put out 12 songs every two or three years you know and i just thought as photographers if we could do that if we had that luxury to do that we could we we would look better you know it's a great Um, analogy it's a great analogy Great yeah, and so I was thinking, like, how is it? Would it be possible for me to just do that, just to come off things? But you, you know, like, for marketing and everything, you have to drip, drip, drip stuff all the time to stay in people's but consciousness. Do you, or you do you feel? Really? I don't know. You feel you have to. I don't know how true it I really know. is. But um, I don't know if I should. I always felt the last couple of years like I should, I could just stop, and then in two years or at the end of the year, just put out my six, eight, ten, whatever, you know. Um, and I think it would elevate us of what we do, but. I don't, I don't know if that will take off. I'll try it, maybe. No, g- go for it. Tell me if it works, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'll let, you, <laughs> I'll let you know. I really wanted to ask about the Olympics. So what was the first Olympic Games that you photographed? First Olympic Games was Atlanta, um, okay. 96. And uh, I've got an interesting story here because, um, I mean, yeah, obviously it was... It was, it was for me it was you know like walking into the, the mouth of a lion you know you you, you the, the next level up from mm. shooting daily and then going to an olympics okay. is beyond belief i mean the last olympics i did i'll come back to atlanta but the last olympics mm-hmm. i did was rio or the last summer olympics i did was rio and uh i i, I had a, a fitbit on and i slept for four hours and 27 minutes a day for mm. 16 days you know, I mean, it's insane what you put your body through and the, the, the rigors of getting to places with all your gear all the time, you know. But in Atlanta, the uh, they had the, uh, I think it was halfway through, um, they had a bomb, a bomb went off. Okay. And we were very close. And a, a, a colleague of mine, Jacqueline Magna, and I ran out to, we heard the bomb. We I picked my camera up. She got, a, you know, off we went, running against the crowd. All of a sudden, you know, police slammed me to the ground and they just picked my cameras up and started smashing them, you know? Uh, and she got, uh, Jacqueline got maced. Um, so, I, f- funnily enough, you know, some some su- spectators who had been drinking sort of came to my aid to stop the police mm. from from beating me up, basically, you know, and mm. stopping them. And um, by the time they sort of settled it all down, I, I had one body that still worked and one lens that still worked. So I was oh, still actually gosh. able to make uh, make some some images, you know. But um, it was it was quite an experience for a first Olympics, you know. But as you said, like for you it's stepping into that arena, as it were, it's, it sounded like it must be how it is for the athletes. They're at the Olympics now. It's a big, big deal. It's the next level. So was there some anxiety about that, or do you just get into flow and you just when you maybe you just have to take that moment to breathe it in and then you just go okay i'm here to do my job and you you just go and do it would would that be your approach yeah i I don't think i particularly had a a really good uh first olympics i mean i learned again the failing forward process Mm -hmm. you know i I think i I think the first assignment i had to do was a baseball game australia were playing in a a baseball game in the in the um uh, the, the stadium where the atlanta braves play and uh I literally, I remember walking towards the stadium and I literally had every piece of gear on me that you could possibly mm. be good because I wasn't quite sure whether yeah. I needed a, a, a fish eye or a 600 mil, you know, and yeah. I literally had everything. And I was like, <laughs> after that, I thought, 
I can't do this for the next 16 days. I'm, you know, it's, it was insane. And, uh, mm. you know, you learn, you learn the process. And you learn how to pace yourself and you learn mm -hmm. when to go. How. I mean, the, the thing is, it's like, if I could just, uh, what Olympic Games is like, it's like doing three FA Cup finals a day. So mm -hmm. if you might, or, you know, some, or three Grand Slam finals a day, if you like. So, so you, you go along and you shoot it and you might have a, a, a terrible shoot, but in two hours time, you'll be shooting another Grand Slam final of another sporting mm -hmm. event, you know. And that might be terrible, but then two hours' time you'll be shooting, and you might have a great... So one in three ain't bad. You might have a great shoot at one in three. So it keeps mm -hmm. you going, and you try not to dwell on the, on the oh, I missed that, should have got that, didn't see that, you know. Mm -hmm. But it happens. I mean, it's just, it's just you know, you sometimes you get there late, you can't get in the right position, or things don't go your way. There's so many factors. It's mm -hmm. times 10 to a normal to a normal day's work, you know, but yeah. as I've, as I've progressed, so I've done six summer Olympics and four winter Olympics now. And, um, you learn how to, you know, you learn how to yeah. cope and how to better manage yourself and how to be smarter. It's always about how to be smarter. You know, it's, it's that, um, uh, I, I, there's one, one saying that I love is uh, chance favors a prepared mind, mm -hmm. which, uh, I, I use when I have done a few workshops, I've used that, quite a bit and I, I think that's s s spot on for, for sports photographers you know you have to prepare your mind to, to give yourself that chance you know if you're going to give yourself a chance against everybody else it's that preparation mentally that is so important to know what you're doing to know what's going to happen to know where it's going to happen to mm. to work out where the best <laughs> you know where the best spot will be for the best action picture or the or or the light or the shade or the you know the mm. aesthetics of what you're shooting it's all it's always a, a failing forward learning process mm. so just to follow on from that say you, you've got a, a big event so i guess at the olympics there's probably a lot of things you have to cover that are not that big or exciting like the handball second round might not be a <laughs> Don't, big deal not but... the handball i've got to tell you the handball <laughs> if, if you said to me which is which is your favorite event at the olympics um i would say for three three olympics in a row the women's handball final was uh south korea versus denmark and uh the first one went into triple overtime and uh i think a player called andy anderson missed a penalty in normal time and the last minute and then she scored a hat trick in 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 uh in uh, extra time, you know, <laughs> the following Olympics, exactly the same thing happened, you know, double over time. And then the following Olympics, the same again. So they had three Olympics in a row where this, the women's handball, I actually, I actually, in the end, after the third one, um, my, my, a couple of colleagues and I, we actually sent the Denmark, the Denmark team, a load of pictures in, in exchange for a shirt. And I've never oh, actually yeah. done that with anything else, but I was just so, so amazed that, you know, the sequence of events had happened with mm. the, the handball. And it's normally on the last day, you know, it's the last thing you tie it out and you mm. absolutely, oh no. And you, you know, drag, you each drag each other to the, to the, to the court to go and shoot it. And after the first one, it was like, got to shoot the handball. We've got to shoot the handball, <laughs> you know? So I like, I mean, it's just like, I mean, I, I don't know if, even if they published anything, it's just, um, you know, you just, it's just an, it was just amazing, you know, mm. to shoot it. And, and there is no, there is no down events. There is no down events. It's okay. everything is, you know, I think my best selling great. picture from the last Olympics was an Indian girl got a bronze medal in the wrestling. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it's like India's only medal ever in an okay. Olympic games or, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> somewhere in that region, you know? Yeah. So, so for her, it was absolutely massive for a nation. It was absolutely massive, you know. And for you, you've just sat yourself down on a spot and, oh, I'll shoot some wrestling, you know, and then yeah. something happens. And it's, it's you know, <laughs> it's bizarre how you, you just, and you want to be everywhere. You can't be everywhere. You want to be everywhere, you know. If you're mm. in wrestling, you want to be at the basketball. Or you, if you're at basketball, you want to be at the swimming. Or you, it's just, it's, it's, it's fantastic as well. It's, uh, yeah. I, you know, it's amazing being at them. It sounds pretty grueling because uh, you have to be really focused on, uh, at the work, right? And then you're going to three events a day. That's really, really tough. Um, but I, what I was going to ask was, um, if you ever, uh, there's a shot I saw on your website with uh, David Rudisha at the 2012 Olympics. 
Yes. And he's he's won the race, he's got his hands up. And there's there's an expected result, like on that race, I remember, because we're following for Kenya, obviously, but there was an, an expectation that he was going to break the world record. Yes. Um, and he did. But yes. I was wondering, from a photography point of view, you can't just follow Radisha around, right? You must be aware of that story. That's the new sense, I guess, that you were talking about. But that you can't just follow him around with your long lens, right? How do you, how do you sort of hedge that as you're shooting? You've got to remember that um, there are literally hundreds of photographers there, and you know, at the end of the track, you, I don't think it'd be like this in Tokyo. Tokyo is going to be Tokyo is going to be completely different, but. There are a hundred photographers yeah. crammed in. There's probably four hundred remote cameras set up, pointing at the finish line, mm-hmm. that are you know past the end of the track where everybody's got the remotes set up, and you literally have to get there early, try and get a position that's looking down the track. So, and um, yeah, okay, we'd all love to be in a unique spot, but you know, there's only so many positions yeah. in the field of play, for, and they're normally the wires and the you know, whichever, you know, Getty, The Wires, local media. Um, so you you just have to do your best and get in a position where you can see and get an angle as, as best you can. Mm, and obviously okay. then you're, I mean, it's hard actually when, you, when you're watching, you know, uh, r- runners coming at you, 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 you're trying to pick which one's in front, <laughs> you mm, know, because yeah. it can be, if somebody's in lane one and lane eight and they look like they're winning, you go, do I go one or eight, one or eight, one yeah. or eight? Um, um, luckily in that particular race, you've got a favorite who's expected to break the world record. You're sort of, you're not hedging your bets as much. You pretty much know, you pretty much knew that he was, you know, 95% chance of winning. And Mm. the other thing is you can watch the screen. You can see a screen. You say you're looking at a screen. Mm. So the screen can give you a different perspective of what you're looking at straight on. And we all help each other. Somebody will say, lane four, and somebody might shout out. Around it, you know, somebody will you'll give an indicator, you know, um, you don't always hear that, but it's sometimes your brain closes yourself off of whatever, whatever, what is happening around you. But at the same time, there's, there's lots of instances where, where, you know, you're helping each other out in that sense. Um, let's go on to talk about your camera gear, if you don't mind. Um, sure. What kind of... I was usually I ask people about a camera and lens combination, but obviously you're using different lenses depending on the thing. But what's your sort of go-to camera at the moment? Um, I'm a Canon guy. Um, <laughs> I, uh, my my top camera at the moment is the uh, 1DX Mark II. I mm-hmm. did have the money saved up for a 1DX Mark III, but um, sort of <laughs> a <laughs> pandemic a pandemic sort of uh, ate away at that one very quickly. Yeah. So yeah. I've got I've got like uh, three camera canon camera bodies mm-hmm. um now it's it's been interesting listening to some of your other uh guests because a lot of people have um said they like the 70 to 200 and i absolutely hate the lens i hate the okay. 70 to 200 <laughs> you know um t- to the point where a few years ago one of them fell out of my camera bag sideways and hit the garage wall but that's another story but um <laughs> you know i you know Canon have an 85 1.4, a 135 f2, and I have a 25-year-old 200 1.8, which is my absolute favorite lens. It looks like mm. it's been in three wars. It's absolutely scratched, smashed, bent, mm-hmm. dinted, but it <laughs> takes the most amazing sharp pictures. I mean, when I shoot the tennis with that 200, I, I normally shoot at 8,000th wide open, mm-hmm. and... So you stop the action, pin sharp, it's crisp, crisp, clear, and you get this beautiful mottled effect. Uh, mm. Particularly if you've got a full crowd in, you get this beautiful mottled effect behind it. You can't get okay. that with the zoom. The zoom mm-hmm. looks like it's been shot through a you know, Robinson's jam jar glass compared to these <laughs> fixed lenses. Okay, in my right. view, in my view, yeah. and I don't want to bag anybody else, if they love that lens, that's fine. Mm. I would rather walk up to the top of a mountain at the at the Winter Olympics with those three lenses, even though they weigh probably three times as much as a seventy to two hundred, mm. than get to the top and have to shoot great action with a seventy to two hundred. I would. I understand. Great for news. Great if you're going to the top of a mountain and you need mm-hmm. to to um, you know pare down and not take a lot of 
lot of gear and the convenience. Um, I understand all that, but mm. I wouldn't swap those lenses for anything. They are mm. three brilliant lenses, you know, particularly so, the 85 and the 200. And I would okay. go, you know, when I'm sat there with those, I'm going, thank God I've got this lens. This lens is amazing. You know, mm. I love those lenses. They're amazing. That's it's so interesting to hear you say that because I'm thinking for covering a, a moving event, I want to zoom, you know, I want to be able to be in and out and not have to be changing or you have the different lenses on the different bodies, maybe. But um, it's really interesting to hear that from someone who's who's in the field. Um, and so do you we touched on it before, but are you using remote cameras as well sometimes? Yes, yes, definitely. I have the I have, uh, remotes. Um, look, I, I, I'm definitely in a minority. I mean, I saw more, I see more people with zooms than I do with fixed lenses. So mm. don't take, don't take it as gospel from me. It's just what I prefer. I just don't like, the thing is with, with zooms, it's like 95% of the time you can move your feet, you know, <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it, you become lazy. You've got to do two things, not one. It, it doesn't help your thought process. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think it does anyway. I mean, if you're just zooming in and out and trying to check it, I don't know, yeah. unless you're, have time you don't have mm -hmm. time i can understand it as i said i can understand the news value of you know you get something it's fine you know um but in terms of trying to get that absolute pin tag sharp picture mm. you know <laughs> yeah there's, there's no comparison to those three lenses with any zoom that's ever been made you know mm. yeah that's it's such a great point of view um so do you use a monopod when you're shooting as well or yes with the 500, I've got a 500 as well. So okay. I, even the two, I would use a monopod sometimes. It's very heavy lens. And if you mm -hmm. sat, say, courtside for three or four hour tennis game, you, yeah. you, you, you can really, um, you know, <laughs> feel it on your back if you're held in a very heavy lens. So, yeah, yeah I, I use a monopod a lot of time. Okay. And so the 500, that's one that's like going to be over your shoulder like this. It's a, a big <laughs> beast, yeah? Yes, the beast, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. You just I always see people going around with those at sports events. I was wondering about the turnaround uh, at the event. So, do you what happens at, once the the final whistle blows? Where do you go, and how do you start to get your pictures back to the picture editor? Well, uh, you know, things have changed so much in in a relatively short period of time. I mean, when I was working for a newspaper, you, you know, you would. Um, you you might be literally just pinging them back to the office from the camera. You know, you might have a, a, a transmitter on the side of your camera and just and on to the next thing, you know. Right. Or you might you might download it to the computer and send your best five pictures or ten pictures. Um, you know, now I'm not working for a newspaper anymore, so I'm I'm a freelance and um, Getty represent my work now. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit more considered. Um, I just say I'm shooting a football match. I would probably shoot the first half, just say there's been a goal. I might send half a dozen pictures at half time because you're, you're there and you can download, send a few pictures. Same again at the end of the game, send maybe 10, 12 pictures. And then I will go home and literally edit for a day, you know, do all your back edits, all your stock pictures, um, you know, clean everything up, make sure they're all looking really good. And mm -hmm. I, 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 might, I actually really enjoy it because it, you know, you're not, you don't have that ultimate deadline of, of a newspaper. You know, I, I remember, I'm just talking about deadlines. I, I went to the, uh, um, the World Cup in Germany when Australia made, Australian soccer team made the, the World Cup and the, they were, uh, the time difference obviously is massive. And yeah. uh, they were one nil down with 10 minutes to go, Australia, and they won 3-1. Nice. And, yeah. and it was like, they, they scored three goals in like five minutes. Um, mm -hmm. on deadline you know so the whole story <laughs> had changed the dead i'm literally trying to send three pictures one of each goal you know it's quick and the, you know i'm on the phone to the and they're screaming they're screaming we've got two minutes we've got two <laughs> minutes before the press go you know and you're literally trying to get one picture through of a celebration or you know yeah. and it's like the pressure is <laughs> it's incredible but that's you know I mean it's also great I mean you the adrenaline rush and the yeah. the ability to 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 function in that situation is is also pleasing especially when you do a good job and things things go to plan you know I mean yeah. that's that's part of being a newspaper and that's part of being competitive in that field. So with, now that you're uh, on your own and you're selling through Getty, 
So how you upload them to Getty and then whoever wants to buy them, whichever publication wants to buy those pictures can pick the one they want and then you somehow split the money with the with the website. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I can't speak highly enough of them. I mean, they, they, they do an amazing job. I mean, they've got a massive... They, they obviously sell more sports pictures than anybody else on the planet. And, uh, you know, I mean, even... You know the, the the just dealing with them is just fantastic. Everything is, all the systems are very user friendly. Even something like me can work out how to <laughs> how to do it. You know, and um, yeah, it's great. And and I you know I've learned the importance, particularly during lockdown, that you have this massive um, archive of images with them that keep selling even when you're not shooting. Now, mm. okay, it's. <laughs> I mean, it's not been great. It's not like, you know, I, I haven't shot. I mean, this summer I was supposed to shoot, you know, three more tennis slams and the Olympics. Mm. So all that stock has not gone into Getty yeah. because I haven't shot it. Mm. So you can see the tail off. It's only yeah. natural. You know, if you haven't, you've got to keep shooting and you've got to keep filing in top end sport. And I just haven't been able to do that because of the pandemic. So you see the drop off. You can see the drop off happening. But at the same time, I've been in a lot better position than uh, a lot of photographers who are basically, I've gone down the work-a-day, pay-a-day route, and they don't, uh, they wouldn't work for nothing. You know, they, they don't want to do that. They don't want to work on spec and just file. And, you know, I, I've been very fortunate that that was the path I, I chose. And I, and I realize now how lucky I've been because I have colleagues who haven't made a cent in nine months they haven't been held by the government you know they've just been left they've just been hung out to dry mm. and it's a disgrace really you know the, the people who really needed helping in our profession have had nothing and i've got a lot of friends who are really doing it tough right now mm, yeah I, I feel i've been very very lucky very lucky mm. so um i wanted to ask about the camera craft then so um, I'm talking about when the camera's in your hand, what are you doing? Are we looking at a manual? Are we looking at other ways to make it easier? I feel like when a, a live event like that, I want to do everything I can to kind of get the camera out of the way. Do you know? I want to just make it as easy for myself mentally and with the finger stuff that I can so I can look at what's happening. Is that a similar approach for you or how do you go at that with the camera in your hand? Yeah, I think we've got to the stage where the technology is so good um, you know that you can shoot at high ISO now, and you still can get a very good quality image. So I yeah. moved from from uh, setting the ISO. I now shoot auto ISO mm -hmm. with on TV. So I'll, you know, if the light's really bad, I will just reduce the the shutter speed to. I, I probably won't go above six thousand four hundred. I don't want to go above that. Occasionally, if you're on auto, it will. But that's mm -hmm. my sort of personal. Uh, cut-off point that I'm working to if this is the shutter speed and that's the aperture and that's the light this is what I want you know and that helps in many ways and you've also got the advantage if you happen something does happen in a you know a, a very uh, dimly lit area you, your ISO will you know you might shoot something at you know I don't know 12,000 ISO but you've still yeah. got the image rather than it being completely unusable so yeah. I've, 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 again, I've, I've changed tack a lot. I never used to do that, but that's what I do right now. Mm, I think it's a great way to go at it, really. I, I just discovered auto ISO in the last couple of years, and it just made sense suddenly. I, d I didn't really understand it before, or why I would need it. But um, for certain types of work, I think it's just it's just amazing. And it, it, like when you use it in, in conjunction with getting the other settings that you're trying to get, it's just so helpful. Yeah, um, I mean, as, I, as I explained before, when I've got the 200 at the tennis, I will make sure I'm shooting 8,000th wide yeah. open. And then <laughs> the ISO will look after itself. You know? yeah. Unless it's really dark, then I'll reduce the shutter speed. But basically, that's my go-to uh, combination. And so this is getting really nerdy. I always feel like a complete camera nerd when I talk about this subject. But how about autofocus modes and autofocus area modes? Because I think the AF area mode has got to be really important for you. I, I tend to I tend to um, start off with the spot, and I will be moving the spot left or right depending on mm. you know 
say for instance at the tennis again a good example so if i'm sat with the player on my right i will have the order focus spot high and to the right because you you're always trying to make sure you've got the head sharp or the mm-hmm. eye sharp you know so it's roughly where where if they if they're coming in with the racket uh forehand or backhand so depending on whether they're left-handed or right-handed on there to the right and you've got you trying to position that spot mm. within your screen and you, you might move to the other end and just change it around so it's the other way so mm-hmm. all the time you're trying to make sure that that spot is going to be where the face is when say if they lunge for the ball or they you know something dramatic happens in front of you um so uh, yeah it's, it's mainly i'm using spot and moving it all the time you're shooting at a fast shutter speed most of the time but there will be times when you want to use a slow shutter speed um, to do something that just to give it a different look when would you just try and use that slower shutter speed to would it be to impart a different sense of speed or how would you go about that when does when do you think oh i can now try this slow shutter speed shot yeah i, I mean the great thing about s- slow shutter speeds in sport is it creates up creates that impression of motion and movement Mm-hmm. So you can you can produce beautiful artistic um, images with slow shutter speeds. So you talk about the Olympics of so fencing. Everybody shoots a fencing on a quarter of a second because okay. you've got this, <laughs> these white figures with a black background mm-hmm. and then red and green lights, and you get the lunges that, that mm-hmm. and you just get these beautiful shapes of of movement of the white against the black background. And uh, you know you, if you actually, I mean every. You'll 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 see. Look out for the next Olympics and look for fencing, mm-hmm. and you'll see lots of these amazing movement shots. But you know, cycling is a and cycling. I I love shooting the cycling at slow shutter speeds, particularly when you like the pursuits team. You know, so you've got four of them in unison, absolutely mm-hmm. going at the same same speed, and you pan mm-hmm. that, and it, it looks incredible. Rowing, yeah, rowing. You know, I look looking. I was I did I did a series on rowing, and just shooting again at a quarter of a second so you get this beautiful flow of, mm. of the rowers as they're as they're moving through their motion and you don't get it every time but within a you know if you're shooting out for two or three hours you you might get you're one getting... image that is absolutely beautiful aesthetically you know mm. so there would there would be certain sports that just kind of give themselves naturally to that kind of style of shooting maybe yeah i think i think there are but i think everything you can you can shoot pretty much anything, you know, even shooting messy at a quarter of mm. a second, you can get an amazing picture if you, yeah. if you work at it, you know? Um, I mean, it takes a lot of commitment and you, you, if you're doing that, you're not doing anything else. You're yeah. trying to get that one frame, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, it's a trade off. You're trading off trying to get a particular image, particular image, um when you're doing slow show speeds but it's great yeah. it's great to do i do it all the time most mm. sports photographers will do it you know on any given event i guess you know and particularly yeah. olympics you it, lots of sports lend itself to to uh slow shutter speeds mm. so okay so there's the equipment that we've spoken about and the the technical stuff but what does you what do you think great sport photography really comes down to <sighs> A million dollar question hey <laughs> um look i mean it's, it's a combination i mean i mean i would talk to earlier about you know the the photographers i admire the most and they have the ability to be great action photographers you know where they're actually they've caught the pinnacle of the action with a fast shutter speed and it's just an amazing action photograph you know but they can also see light and shade and shadows and they can can you know they can also take pictures with movement and they can do great portraits and and it's a combination of all those things it's not just one thing you know and if if that image is a, has a great aesthetic feel to it then it's a good picture you know if you look at a picture and go i like that you don't even have to know why you like it you know if it appeals mm-hmm. to you visually by looking at it then it's it's a good picture even if you didn't take it even if somebody else took it and you like that image there's a reason why and it's it's normally because of the aesthetics of of what you're looking at. Okay, so this brings us to a special round called Double Exposure, and I'm going to ask you about a picture. I might ask you about two, actually, um, just about the story behind the images. And then uh, if there's one that you have an epic story about, then you can share that as well. But 
I, I did want to bring up the man in the bubble, which is the World Press Photography winning image from, is it 94, I think? Yes, correct. Um, yes. So there must, first of all, it must have been uh, quite a buzz to win that award. But uh, what can you tell us about that photograph? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, answer your first question. Yeah, it's an amazing, you know, feeling for me. It was a great achievement. And, I, you know, I've been very, very fortunate that, you know, I've, I've won the World Press a few times and I, mm. I'm not sure I really deserve to have, uh, have won the amount of times I have. But um, that particular image, um, it's a picture of a swimmer called Matthew Dunn. And uh, it's quite a funny story in a way because I, I had to photograph him in the morning. He'd won some award, you know, his services to something or other and uh, just got chatting to him after the... You know, it's nothing of a picture. It was literally a presentation. And I... Oh, you're mm. not here training today? It's, yeah, I'm training in my my uh, my old school swimming pool on my own. So I was like, "Do you mind if I come along and do some shots?" Okay. He said, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. So, so I went along in the afternoon, and uh, we ended up. He was practicing. He was practicing his starts, and um, if you if you have a flat pool, it has a surface tension, mm-hmm. and he would dive in and break the surface of the water, but he would swim, his, you know, his m- momentum would swim faster than the ripple. So mm-hmm. he would come up where the surface tension of the water is and pretty much worked out where he was coming up from his starts. And uh, I think I, I was shooting film those days and I think I took seven rolls of film while he was doing his start routines. And there was one frame. And obviously okay. you only need one frame, but there was one frame and... Uh, you know, I just I just couldn't believe it when mm. uh, when I when I saw it. I mean, it's just uh, um, and you know you see it you see it all the time. If you go to the Olympics, a lot of mm-hmm. times you're too far away, but you see the exact same thing happening. Mm-hmm. And I was just fortunate that in that controlled situation in a smaller pool, I, I was able to 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 get that image. And so, when you win a, an award like that, like you said, you've won it a, a few times, but. Does it really do anything for your career or is it just uh, nice uh, and then the next day you go back to normal? I think it, I think it does a lot for your career. I think it gives you a, a standing within mm-hmm. the newspaper that you work for. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it, it gives you a standing amongst your colleagues. So you get the respect from it and it gives you a standing for the athlete, you know, with the athletes that you're shooting and with the sporting bodies. If, if they mm-hmm. know that you're professional at that level and you're asking you know um you're asking for access to a dressing room for instance or you're asking yeah. to they, they, they seem to trust you more you have a little bit more clout you have a little bit more respect and uh i, I you know i think and it gives you the confidence as well it gives you a lot of confidence to to push yourself and you know it's it's a, mm. I, I guess it's the old thing of like uh, okay you've won the you know, you win an Olympic gold medal, what do you do next? Well, try and win another one, you know, and you've yeah. got to go out and practice and train and do all the do all the things again that you were doing. And mm-hmm. uh, um, again, I know it's a sporting analogy, but I think um, it's so true. It's so true. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that mental strength and awareness of, of where you're at and, and trying to continue at that, at that level of shooting of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. There was just, if you don't mind, another shot that I wanted to ask you about, which was called Phoenix Rising on your website. And it's a free, freestyle skiing shot. And I'm, I've read the caption, but I'm still trying to figure it out. So it's really, it almost looks like a negative. So the, most of the frame is black and there's this white speckling on the frame and a, a white silhouetted figure, which is sort of a negative to what you feel like it should be. It's really quite a striking image. And um, can you tell me anything about that one? Yes, so the, this this was taken at the last Winter Olympics in uh, South Korea, and uh, on the um, uh, freestyle, uh, before they compete, the photographers are allowed to go under the kicker, so the, the skier will come down and then go up a kicker, and as he, as he comes up the kicker, he will do, him or, he or she will do their flips, but all the snow will explode off the kicker as well. I see, okay. Okay, and we're underneath, and there's no chance of them landing on us. They're going to mm-hmm. land on the side of the hill, but so you know there might a few. You know, there's obviously quite a few photographers there. So um, we're all underneath. There's three. Normally, there's three kickers, 
that that the skiers go off to uh, to do their perform their aerial aerial routines. And um, I, I worked out. Um, in fact, I actually found out by accident. I, I I did the first picture, and I had the completely wrong exposure. So you know, we were talking about um, <laughs> auto ISO. You know, mm-hmm. I I had it on auto ISO, but because I was on auto ISO, it had literally blown out the skiers and the snow mm-hmm. against a black a black sky. You know, because it's night time. It's just yeah. literally nothing there, you know. Mm-hmm. So I looked at the exposure, um, and it was it was like it was it was like a really high ISO, mm-hmm. so and a really high shutter speed, and I completely, uh, you know, flicked it. And I thought, oh, hang on a minute. So I set it to manual of all those settings, mm-hmm. and literally the next three days, I went <laughs> to that event to the pre warm up where they go off the kickers and kept shooting these amazing, Im- you know, I, I was like you know, really, really, uh, you know, blown away by the, the, mm. the effect. But it was just literally tweaking the exposure against a black background, which made the, mm. the, the skier, which obviously the floodlights were catching the skier, but if mm. you overexposed it, they would white out, but you still yeah. had a black background, mm. you know? <laughs> it's yeah, like, it's, a, it's like a happy <laughs> accident, but it's a bold choice just to go with it as well. It's so, um, it's just creative and brave. I really admire you for going with that shot. Actually, uh, I was going to ask if there's if there's one shot. I know you've shot zillions of things, but anything that really stands out as a memorable moment or something that was just a great, great shot for you, or doesn't even have to be a great photo, just a great moment in your career. Um, I think one of, one of my favourite shots, and it didn't really win any awards. It was just I got great pleasure from seeing the image. Was um, of a, a baseball pitcher about to pitch and there's a bolt of lightning gone off mm. in the background and I, I call that strike one just uh, <laughs> just as a, a sort See of what you corny did caption a corny <laughs> caption if you like but you know I it was in it was in Sydney in a, a football stadium at Parramatta where the the Sydney Blues or Sydney Storm uh, they changed names we used to play and um, the pitcher was called Adam Meinenschager and uh there was this electric storm going off in the distance and every now and again there was a a lightning bolt going i was mm. trying to trying to capture the the lightning bolt and uh i you know you, you can tell when you're missing a lightning bolt and it it was uh i was persevering and persevering and and all of a sudden there was a twitch of lightning and i pressed the, the shutter and as i pressed the shutter the big bolt of lightning came you know just mm. And it was straight behind the picture, and mm. I was on film, and I went, "God, I think I got that. I think I got that." I couldn't <laughs> look at the back of the screen like you do nowadays. Yeah. Nowadays, I would know within five seconds whether I got it. And I think the, the the game finished at like midnight or something, and I had to drive into the office and process the film because I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep thinking about it. So I then drove back into the city, processed the film, and and there it was on the negative. The and the, and it was sharp as well, which was the other thing. So, uh, you know, and I, I I couldn't believe. You know, it was it was a time when we used to scan negatives. So, uh, mm-hmm. um, I didn't actually scan it that night, but I came in the next day and 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 scanned. And uh, I think it was just one of those things that gave me great pleasure to to have have uh, you know managed to photograph it, managed to capture it as much yeah. as part of as much as anything. Yeah, it's great. I'll put a link in the show notes so people can check that out. It's really amazing. Um, okay, we've gone way over time, as I always do now. <laughs> I'm saying this every episode, but um, let's hit the quick fire round if you're ready for that. It's called Motor Drive because, you know, it's yep. fast moving. So, <laughs> uh, okay, wide angle or telephoto? Uh, medium telephoto. Okay. Uh, coffee or tea? Tea. Head or heart? Well, I would say... I would say heart, but you have to use both sides of your brain after that as well. Okay, a good answer. Uh, okay, Beatles or Stones? Definitely Beatles. What was the last great uh, book, movie, series or album you experienced? Okay, well, this week, oh, I've, I've actually read it. This week, I've just finished reading Roddy Doyle, Charlie Savage. And I'm now reading James O'Brien's How Not To Be Wrong. And two nights ago, I watched Wonder Wheel, which is a Woody Allen movie. So those are my okay. <laughs> my latest uh, 
<laughs> and I just listened to the best of the jam before we came on here, music-wise. Okay, so. good one. Okay, well, I'll put all the links in the show notes for those. Um, okay, expensive lens cloth or corner of your shirt? Definitely corner of the shirt. Yes, I'm with you there. Well, I always <laughs> say that, but if if I have a cloth, I'll use it. But anyway. Um, I can never find it. I, I always have it in a pocket somewhere. And it's always like if there's rain coming in or, you you know, it's always in the end, oh, you know. Get, yeah. yeah, I actually make sure now that I wear a like a soft tracksuit top or something to <laughs> to actually have a soft material that I can actually wipe the lens with quickly. Um, what we should invent some, is a photographer's shirt with a corner that's got lens cloth material uh, on. Somebody the has, somebody has, somebody's done that already. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I think it's called Griff Griff Gear. Griff Gear. They've invented something with uh, with a, a, a cloth. Within it's it, made of made of microfiber. Okay, well, yes. my idea is gone there, but I'll put a link in the show notes for that anyway. Um, okay, what's a weird thing I could find in your camera bag? A shirt with a made of microfiber, probably. Anyway, <laughs> Ooh. normally, normally it would be sweets or chocolate or a constant supply of keeping the blood sugar levels high and uh, mm-hmm. um, keeping my brain fed with 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 something, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, you try and eat, but sometimes if you're in a four and a half hour match and you haven't eaten for six yeah. hours, you know, you, and you don't want to leave and you get hungry and you start feeling your blood sugar levels uh, yeah. tanking a bit, then it's it's always good to make sure you've got something and lots of water as well, you know, uh, mm. water in your bags and you know, make sure uh, most events are pretty good in, in terms of looking after you to make sure you have uh, liquid, but okay. it's also important to keep eating. I always think it's amazing on these five hour matches how the tennis players can keep functioning, you know, like mentally. I don't know how you hold your con. Like, I'll be watching it and I'll just zone out for spells of time. I don't know how they can possibly stay with it for the five hours. It's amazing. I mean, it is amazing. I mean, if I don't know if you've watched, uh, you know, Nadal is, uh, <laughs> he has some, he has some amazing little things that he does all the time mm-hmm. on court. Yeah. Like when, the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when, the, um, the game finishes, he will walk back through the cross of the end of the court and he'll walk back around and get his towel and go to sit down. And then he has two bottles. One mm-hmm. of them will be with a sweet drink and one of them will be water. And he'll drink the sweet drink and then he'll drink the water. And then he'll place them back down in the precise position. So the label's facing outwards, mm-hmm. absolutely next to it. And he, it, sometimes it takes him like 30 seconds to... He's so pedantic in what he's doing. It takes him about 30 seconds to... To line them up exactly as it as it wants. It's, it's it's an amazing insight into his mindset, you know. I was gonna mention uh, we've kind of gone past it, but there's a shot you've got of Nadal on here, and uh, there's like the ball boy or ball girls like unfurling the towel, and there's that beautiful gesture in the towel, um, and he's sort of marching towards it with his focused look, and I just thought it really captures him, you know, because they'll always go to the towel, you know, after every point. And I just thought that was a great, um, a great moment that you captured with that one. With thank you, down. thank you. What I what what struck me about that picture was the ball boy looked like he was a matador, and right. Nadal, Nadal is called he's El Toro, the, bull, the yeah. bull. Yeah, you know, and that's his his whole emblem. <laughs> it looked like he was about to charge. You know, yeah. Uh, that that was the, my connection with that image. You know, I, I thought it had a, a another meaning, not just uh, yeah. the intensity. Totally works. Um, Thank you. Okay, okay. Let's get back on our track here. When do you feel at peace with the universe? Um, walking up a hill with the sheep and looking across absolute beauty, and you know, realizing that it's it's a pleasure to be on this planet, even if it's for however long it is. You know that it's still a beautiful place, even even now, and it's so important to. It's so important for us to actually save this planet as well i'm getting very you know i had i had no interest in politics for the first 50 years of my life i've just vote green or liberal or not really mm. get into it and now i've got so angry about mm. so many things you know and what are we doing for our future for our kids you know mm. i've become almost like a <laughs> an activist you know I'm getting just yeah. very very cross with a, a lot of things right now and we've got to change and we're trying to do it as well we're trying to change how we live and we recognize it I mean, this has really been a, a massive jolt in the way we think. I think it's certainly jolted me into, okay, what is important in life? What mm. do I want to do? What kind of a, 
world do I want to leave for my daughter, you know? And we've got so much wrong at the moment. It's just frustrating, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, we, yeah, it's funny. My daughter on Christmas Day said, let's go pick rubbish up on the beach. And we actually mm-hmm. went for an hour. We got plastic bags and we, got, we had some pickup litter um, sticks, you know. And we actually mm-hmm. picked up about, you know, two dozen bottles. And, and it was great that she instigated that, you know. And I sort of feel proud that it was her, not me, who thought of that. So we've done it like half a dozen times since. We'll just go, let's go pick up some rubbish. Mm-hmm. And, and we go and pick bottles off the beach and uh, makes you feel a little bit better. You know, it's only a small thing. But if everybody does a small thing, we will help, you know. Yeah, it's so beautiful that that comes from a seven-year-old. I just, I really believe, like, our kids are going to save this world. And they're so bright, the kids. Like, my daughter, she's so bright and she knows so much already that I would have never known at that age because of the way information is accessible for her. And uh, I just, when I see those kids and I hear what you said there about your daughter, it just gives me so much hope. Um, So I think we're going to be okay. I hope you're right, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're optimistic, you know. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, okay. Thanks so much for your time, Tim. It's just, I could, we could have gone on so much longer, and I thought uh, it got much worse when I started asking you questions because the info that was just coming out of you was so rich, and I really appreciate that. Thanks so much for giving your all to this interview. No, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really uh, humbled to, to be invited, and, you know, listening to all your other photographers on uh, on your podcast so, i mean I've, I've learned so much already and it's fantastic listening to the experiences of you know different photographers in different uh, genres and uh, mm-hmm. it's great thank you so much graham and good luck to you as well thank you so much for listening you can support tim by visiting his website and print shop where you can see and buy some of his incredible images links are in the show notes and you can follow some of the other amazing photographers he mentioned links are down there in the notes too That's it for this week. Thanks for your time. Be kind. Enjoy your photography. I'll see you out there.